another day, another challenge. Well, actually, we're still on the same day. We're still on day four of Advent of Code 2024, which is a series of programming challenges. And I'm tackling these programming problems in my esoteric programming language, Funkiton. You know, the one with the lines and boxes. Now, in the previous video, we solved the first challenge of that day, where you were supposed to solve a kind of word search and count the number of times that the word Xmas appears in a grid like this, written in any direction, horizontal, vertical, diagonal, and forwards and backwards. And this is the program that we wrote in that video, except that I added some comments. But the gist of it was that we looped through each grid position from the bottom right corner all the way up to the top left corner, and then we loop through the eight directions for every grid position and count how many of those give us the word Xmas. Now, I was going to make a guess at the end of that video as to what the sequel challenge could be, but I couldn't really think of anything that made sense, so I edited that out of the video. But I did get some ideas after the recording, so I'm going to make a prediction now. I think that the sequel is that we're going to have to allow wrapping around the edges. In other words, I think we're supposed to include occurrences of Xmas like this one, which run off the edge of the grid and re-enter the grid on the other side. So let's take a look to see if I'm right. Part 2. The elf looks quizzically at you. Did you misunderstand the assignment? Oh, I misunderstood the assignment. Looking for the instructions, you flip over the word search to find that this isn't actually an Xmas puzzle, it's an Xmas puzzle, in which you're supposed to find two mas, M-A-S, in the shape of an X. Oh, oh, interesting. Okay, so we're supposed to find occurrences of A that are surrounded by M's and S's in this shape. Irrelevant characters have, okay. Here's the same example from before. But this time, all of the X messes have been kept instead. Okay, so we're looking for horizontal, vertical. Wait, no, not not horizontal and vertical, just diagonal. It has to form an X. In this example, an X mess appears nine times. Flip the word search from the instructions back over to the word search side and try again. How many times does an X mess appear? Now that is quite different from what I expected. Okay. Now, you may recall that in the previous video, I basically talked about nested for loops. I had an outer for loop, which goes through the positions in the grid, and then a second level for loop, which tries all eight possible directions. And you may recall that I ran into that problem where I needed to pass four values into a function, into the recursive function for the inner for loop, but Funkiton only allows up to three parameters per function. One thing that for some reason didn't occur to me at all is that I didn't need to write it as a recursive function. I could instead have used the countUp function to create a lazy sequence of integers going up, for example from 0 to the size of the grid minus 1, and then I could have just used the map function to map over each integer, and I could absolutely have nested one inside the other to get the nested for loop kind of mechanic. So today this is what we're going to do. That gives me an opportunity to show you the two different strategies. Now this time we no longer want to loop over all of the grid positions, we only need to loop over w minus 2 times h minus 2 of them. So the number of positions that we need to look through are two columns and two rows fewer. But we don't just want to count up from 0 to the product of those. You want to go from 0 to w minus 3, and then you want to jump to w, and then go to 2w minus 3, and so on. And then for each such position in the grid, we can look at these five values. And let's say we look at the middle one first, we always want that to be an A. And then the other four need to be two M's and two S's, but only in four possible specific combinations, namely MMSS, MSSM, SSMM, and SMMS. If you have any other combination of two M's and two S's, for example MSMS, then it won't form the word MAS that we're looking for. It'll instead be MAM and SAS, and we don't want that. So I'm going to generate these five letter words from every grid position, and then I'm going to use a regular expression to determine that it's one of the strings that we're looking for. Now looking at the program from the previous video, I think I'm just going to get rid of everything that we don't need, which is the two inner for loops. And then I'm going to zoom into the main program. And since the whole thing is going to be one main program, I'm going to get rid of that comment. 
Okay, so we have our sequence of lines of text, which we are splitting at the new line, which is character number 10. And then this obtains the first value from that sequence, in other words, the first line of text, so that we can determine its length, and that will give us the width of the grid. And here we are counting how many lines of text there are, so that gives us the height of the grid. And then finally, we are joining them all up with the empty string, so we get a single string containing all of the letters in the grid without the new lines. So let me get rid of all the rest of this function, and let's label all of these things. So this is where the grid comes out, this is where the height comes out, and this is where the width comes out. Now let's create that sequence of grid positions that we want. Now, in the previous video, we only needed the height in order to calculate the size of the grid. I claim that that is still basically the case, except this time we want height minus 2. So I'm going to subtract 2 from the height in order to get the number of rows that we actually want to look at. For the width, however, I think we are going to need the original width as well as the decremented width, but let's get to that later. Let's start by creating the sequence of numbers going from 0 to height minus 2. Now for each of these height values, we want to go through all of the values from 0 to width minus 2, and we want to end up with a single sequence of all of those values rather than a sequence of sequences. So we're going to use the bind function. So now we have a lambda expression where the input, which comes out here, is one of those numbers, which I'm going to call y, because it's basically a y coordinate within the grid. And what we want to put in here, the output of the lambda expression, is the sequence of values for that particular row of coordinates. And that particular row of coordinates starts at w times y, and there are w minus 2 of those values. So we need to call the same function as we did here, but this time instead of starting at 0, we need to start at w times y. So let's do the multiplication first. And then we invoke the integer sequence function. Let's now calculate the w minus 2, and then let's join up the two places where we need the width. As you can see, I kept a copy of the w, because I'm pretty sure that we're going to need that to index into the grid later. But for now, let's deal with the sequence that comes out of here. So this is now our sequence of coordinates. Let's escape that from this confined space by using a y-crossing function. And now we need to iterate over all these integer grid positions. So let's use a map function. Now, what characters do we need to extract from the grid? Well, for every grid position, we want the character at that position, the character 2 to the right, which is plus 2, the character that is diagonally below and to the right, which is plus w plus 1, and then the bottom two, which is plus 2w and plus 2w plus 2. Except that we want the middle one first. So we need to create a list or a lazy sequence, I'm going to make it a lazy sequence, of those exact five values. So I'm going to write a function for that. I'm now going to create a lazy sequence entirely by hand, instead of using functions such as the countup function. So let's start with the first value. We want to create a lazy sequence in which that is the first value. And every lazy sequence is a lambda expression, so let's start with that. And lazy sequences don't care about the input, so we silence that. And we want the first output to be i plus w plus 1, so let's start with an addition. And we can do the w plus 1 by just invoking the increment function. Now the second output of that lambda expression wants to be another lambda expression, because we need to continue the sequence by returning the tail, which is another sequence. The next value is easy, it's literally just i, so I'm just going to put that here. And then we march steadily on, let's make another lambda expression. So the next element we want here is i plus 2, and let me move this up a little bit. So I'm going to use the plus function here. And then the lambda expression for the fourth element. Well, this time we want i plus 2 times w, but I'm going to reuse that expression here. So let's just put the expression here for now. And now there is not enough space for a lambda expression here, so I need to pull everything to the right. Lambda box number 5. And now what do we put in the last output? Well, we want the sequence to end here, so we need to pass in the empty sequence as the tail, which is 0. Now, in order to do the plus 2, let's put an addition function right here. And now we have two copies of this i plus 2 times w, so let's connect the two up. Now, this is itself an addition, so let's put an addition box right here. And now we need 2 times w. Now, I could use the multiplication function, but you might remember that in order to do 2 times or any other power of 2, you can actually just use shift left. So I'm going to shift left w by 1, and that'll come out the same. Now, if I haven't made a mistake, we have the sequence, so I don't need that annotation anymore. And now let's connect up all of the occurrences of i. Then we can connect up the w's, and finally we can put in the declaration box. 
Now there's a lot of detail in this function, so I want to make sure that I got it right, so I'm quickly going to test it. So I'm gonna comment out the main program that we have so far, and then let's quickly write a main program that will just call this function with some two values, convert all of those values to strings, and then join them up with commas. So now let's pretend we have a very small grid of width 5, and let's say we start in the top left corner, so 0, and then the values that we expect are, well, first of all, down and right is width plus 1, so it would be 6, and then we would need the top left corner, and then the top right corner, and then the bottom left corner, which is 2 times width, so 10, and then 2 more than that. So we expect 6, 0, 2, 10, 12. So let's run the program and see what happens. And I get an error message, incorrect orientation of connectors to call to function plus. And given the line number and column number, it is pointing me at this plus operation here. Now eagle-eyed viewers among you will have noticed that I actually put this two on the wrong side. It should have been here on the left. So let's quickly fix that. Attempt number two. Bingo. We get exactly the list of numbers that we expected. So that means we don't need this test program anymore, and I can scroll up and remove the comment box. So where were we here? We were mapping over the list of all of the grid positions that we're interested in, which means that what comes out here is a grid position. So we need to call our new function on that and the w. Now I took a copy of my w up here, but now that I notice that we need it here, I'm going to move this around so that the w is in a place that is more convenient right now. So now we get our lazy sequence of the five integers here. They are basically indexes into the string grid now. So now we need to turn those into the actual characters at those positions. So we need another map function. And now what comes out of here, let me scroll up a bit, is an index into grid. So I think we want to use the substring function to obtain the character at that index. And the order of the parameters is string and then index and then length. And we're passing the index in here, which means that this wants to be the length, which is one, because we want one character at a time. And we need the first parameter, which is here, to be the grid. So let's join that up. But now we need the result of that substring function to go into the output for the lambda expression. So we need a wire crossing function here. And now what comes out of the map function here is a sequence of characters which is exactly what we need in order to match it against a regular expression. Now, the last time we used regular expressions, which was for day three of advent of code, we wanted to process each match of a regular expression within a larger string. So the only function that we ever wrote to match regular expressions against a string will go through the entire string and keep finding more and more matches until it reaches the end of the string. But that's not what we need this time. What we want this time is we want to check whether our string matches the regular expression exactly and there is only a single match that spans the entire string. So I'm quickly going to write a new function that does that. So to begin, this new hypothetical function needs to check whether the regular expression matches at the start of the string. So let's use a question mark to check if that's the case. And if it's not the case, then we need to return false. So how do we check if a string matches a regular expression? Well, regular expressions are just lambda expressions that we can just call on the string. And we don't care about the second output from that lambda. And the result of that goes in the question mark. Now, what if the string does match the regular expression? Well, we want to check that it matches the entire string, not just the start of the string. So we need to check if any one of the matches that was returned by the regular expression covers the entire string. So I'm going to use the exists function to check if there is at least one. So let's put a call to that function right here. The sequence we want to check is the sequence of matches, and we need a lambda expression to express the criterion. And now I'm thinking, why did I put a minus one here? If the regular expression returns an empty sequence, then there is no match. So we actually want to return false, which is zero. And it just so happens that the second output of our lambda expression points at it, which is good because we don't care about the second output. So we're going to put zero in there. Okay, now what comes out of here is a match object that was returned by the regular expression. Now, if you remember the regular expression video, a match object is a lambda expression that returns two values. So let's call that lambda expression. And it doesn't care about its input, so we put zero there. Now, the first output returned by that lambda expression is the rest of the input sequence, the string, after the match. 
We want to check if we've covered the entire string, which means that the rest of the string would be an empty sequence, aka zero. So let's check if it's equal to zero. Now we don't care about the second output of this lambda expression, so let's silence that. And we want our lambda to return the result of that equals. And finally, all we need is a declaration box. Now let's quickly write a comment to document this function, and then we can put that in the library. Okay, back to our program. So we have our map function, which returns a sequence of characters that we want to match against. So let's call our new function directly on that. Now what will eventually come out of this function is a boolean, which is zero for false and negative one for true. So if I return that boolean from this lambda expression, then I will end up with a sequence of numbers which are either zero or negative one, which is kind of similar to what we had in the previous video. I can sum them all up and then I will get the negative of the sum that I want. So I will fix that discrepancy by using the unary minus. And then we need to convert the resulting integer to a string for output. And now it comes time to write our regular expression. Now, we said that the sequences that we want to match are a followed by MMSS or MSSM or SSMM or SMMS. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the A at the start and then I'm going to have an alternation of the remaining four possibilities. So at the top level we want the then operator because the A will be followed by something. The first argument to the then is a regular expression that matches just the A and the Unicode value for the capital A is 65. On the other side of the then we want an alternation but we want a four-way alternation so the way that I'm going to do is I'm going to have an alternation of two alternations. Now each of those four different cases will need a regular expression that matches each of these strings and we can use the helper program that I've mentioned multiple times in my previous videos now to determine the integer encoding of any of those strings. So now all we need to do is put all of those numbers into boxes and then we need to convert each of these into a lazy sequence and turn those into regular expressions. And now we have a lambda expression that checks if the strings are what we want and this will return a boolean and then we sum up the booleans. So I think we are done. So let's run this program to see if it works. Let's start by running it on the uh, example input given by the puzzle. And to my surprise, I'm not getting an error message. I'm getting a number six. Unfortunately, the puzzle page says that Xmas appears nine times. So we got the wrong answer. That's a first. Did you spot my mistake? Well, let's think again about this function that we wrote, which returns the five grid coordinates for each of the cross shapes that we want to extract. The order in which it extracts them is middle space first, then the top left corner, top right corner, then the bottom left corner, and then the bottom right corner. But when I came up with the regular expression, I just blindly assumed that they would be in clockwise order. I don't know why I didn't make that explicit. I should have said it out loud and I might have noticed it. So this function returns first the middle square and then the square itself and then the one to the right, which is plus two. So this one here will return the bottom left corner, but we should return the bottom right corner first. We are calculating two times w plus i here, and then we are adding two up here. So we need to move that plus two to the other one, the fourth element in our sequence instead of the fifth. Now I don't have that test program from earlier anymore, but let's just run the program and see what happens. And this time we get a nine, which is what we expected. So now I'm going to run it on the full input. And once again, I'm going to measure the time that it takes. And I expect this to be only slightly faster than the previous one. We are checking fewer grid positions now. It's w minus 2 times h minus 2 instead of w times h. But at the same time, we're matching against the regular expression every time. I don't know if that's slower. Ooh. Okay. That was a lot faster than I expected. 31 seconds. But before we celebrate too soon, let's see if the answer is correct. So I'm going to scroll down on the advent of code page. I'm going to paste it here and submit. And that's the right answer. We are one gold star closer to finding the chief historian. Nice. We now have eight stars out of 50. I do have to say these challenges are incredibly creative. Even when I thought I could predict what the sequel was going to be, it was something different every time. So let's see what day five is going to bring in the next video. You gonna be there?